Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Gareth Shercliffe. I work for the MarkLogic consulting team in the UK. Um, so today we're going to be talking in the session about our geospatial features. Um, firstly, I'm going to be going through a bit of background about how MarkLogic helps us model, think about and interact <coughs> with location and, and geospatial data differently. Um, then I'm going to hand over to Michelle who's going to be going through a real-time demo where you'll see some of those features in action. And then finally, Dave is going to be going through into a technical deep dive and showing how all this stuff works under the hood. So, Michelle, Dave, you, could you introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Michel Lu. I'm a principal sales engineer in the Dutch office. So I'm seeing some familiar faces here. Uh, my role consists of uh, uh, supporting uh, prospects, uh, customers, and uh, partners from a technical perspective. Take of the recording, I'll stand next to Gareth. <laughs> uh, so, Dave Castle, I'm a technical community manager, so I do outreach events as well as managing the developer.marklogic.com website. Um, you may, if you're on the developer email list, you've probably seen my newsletters go out monthly. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so before we start, what I'd just like to do is to get an idea of who we've got in the room. Um, just a couple of questions, okay, a couple of polls, so uh, hands up. Um, how many of you at the moment are using MarkLogic's geospatial features? So that could be in production or it could be just playing around with them. Anyone, anyone had a look? Okay, a few of you. Um, and how many of you, again, are not yet using MarkLogic's geospatial features but have some background in the geospatial community and know about GIS and all that kind of stuff? Okay, so a few people as well. Okay, a good balance of people then. So hopefully everyone will get something from the session. Right. So this little device is changing the way that we all interact with and the way that users expect to be able to interact with location data. So of course that's a, a GPS chip. So it's four grams in, in weight, it's got a built-in antenna. As you can see there it's smaller than a euro. Um, it can communicate in parallel with 22 satellites on 66 channels and it can receive 10 location updates a second. And that costs less than 30 pounds, so it's, it's really cheap. And it's just one example of a range of similar technologies that are uh, like uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, near-field devices, remote sensing devices that are changing the way that we interact with data and collecting a huge amount of geospatial and location data that we just didn't have before. And it's for this reason that nowadays the question has changed for most organisations from not from whether we interact with location data to how we can best interact and use location and geospatial data to add value. And I know there's probably a, a few of you in the room, or many of you in the room maybe, who are thinking, well, I work for a bank, or I work for a, a publisher's, or maybe a hospital. I don't use geospatial data. Well, research studies have shown that at least 80% of all data has some kind of geospatial or location-based um, component or, or relationship. So even if it's just for the purpose of this session, what I challenge you to do is to think of geospatial data not just in terms of that data which is required to support traditional geospatial use cases, so things like routing or surveying maybe, but to think about the operations data which is used to run your business and the location and geospatial components of that. And before we go through into how Markluch does stuff differently, what I'd like to spend just a few minutes doing is thinking about or looking at um, the state of geospatial technology today and really how we've arrived at this state and specifically to make, make one observation which is this. So geospatial technology isn't alone in that over its evolution it's borrowed tools, techniques, even concepts from other technologies which were around at the time that, of that evolution or even cutting edge at the time of that evolution. So geospatial is no different there. And a good example, a really good example from the geospatial field um, is the concept of something called a feature. So you can think of a feature as something which can be mapped. So it could be a point or a polygon or a map. You might have some information surrounding that. And you could argue that the way that we think and the geospatial community generally thinks about the concept of a feature has been limited by this, this relational mindset. Just to walk that through a little bit more. So if I've got a feature, so a feature is something that appears on a map, and in this case I've got a set of features which are buildings, and each row represents a single building. So here's a, a training centre, for example. And in this table, in this schema, I've got a 
geospatially enabled part, the geometry, so this could be a polygon or a point or a circle or a line, something which can be mapped. But I also have some additional information in there which isn't geospatial So right about that feature. So the type of the feature, whether it's residential or non-residential, um, and what the purpose or what that, that feature is used for in the real world, so training centre, school, church. And I guess the, the key point here is that just with, as, as with typically with relational databases, that schema is relatively fixed. So if I want to change that schema, I have to go into the database and make a change and add a, add a field, add a column. And I guess you could argue that that's a contrived example, and of course that's the nature of relational databases, that you do need to go and make those schema changes, and there's other ways of doing this. So let's take a, rather than, than my view on this or our view on this, let's take an authoritative view, which is that of the OGC. So the OGC is the Open Geospatial Consortium, and they're um, kind of the, the equivalent, so if you think of OGC being to geospatial technology as W3CR to the web. So that, that, that's significant in their recommendations. And these are just three examples, three diagrams taken one of their key publications, which amongst other things covers data modelling or modelling of features within um, the geospatial world. So again, you can kind of see that this is just a, another manifestation of what we saw on the previous slide, where we have a, um, a schema which maps a feature, so we define a set of things that can be associated with the feature, and then feature attributes, so these are the, the bits of additional information like type and um, feature use that we saw on the previous slide, again a schema associated with that, and then up here a geometry schema, so the, the schema that defines polygons, points, and associates them with features. And you could, uh, I guess thinking about data modelling at different levels, you could say, well this could be a really just a logical data model and it's up to you how you decide to physically implement that as, as part of your, your database. But the OGC are also pretty specific about that as well. So when we define this from a, a particular chapter. So when we define our geometry schema, there's a, sorry, to read that out. So a demand that rules for representing each feature type with a WKT, so that's a point, a polygon, a line, or a circle, is explicit. So we need to upfront state what kind of feature, sorry, what kind of WKT will be associated with which type of feature. And similarly with attributes, which are those additional bits of information we associate with a feature that aren't necessarily geometries or, or aren't geometries, we need to specify those all upfront as part of our schema. And not only do we need to specify that they exist, we need to specify what type of data can go into those attributes. So really what we're looking at when we go through modelling um, of features and geospatial data in accordance with the guidance of some of the authorities in the area, what we're really doing is going through a relational data modelling exercise. And that's really what the rest of the presentation is, or my part of the presentation is about. So if you're talking about how at MarkLogic, we think of, interact with, and model geospatial data in a different way that helps us build applications better and, and more quickly, for example. And the way that we'd be doing that is going through three paradigm shifts. So three important ways that highlight how we are different in the way that we think about and interact with data, geospatial data, than the status quo. The first of these is creating features that mirror reality. So what do I mean by that? There's two things, so there's variance in geospatial representation. What if I want to interact with a feature differently um, depending on the context of my work? So sometimes I may treat it as a point, sometimes as a polygon, sometimes as a circle. What if there's variance in attributes? What if there's additional information or different information that depending on how I want to interact with that feature I might want to use or take advantage of? And in some cases, there's explicitly data that I don't want to interact with as part of the attribute set for that feature. So let's take a, a scenario and then we'll go through and see how Mark Logic differs from the way that we'd approach this to a, a traditional approach. So let's assume I'm um, an emergency service provider and I turn up to a fire at a particular address in London. Now, this address is usually used as a school, but also at the weekend, or sorry, in the evenings, two of those buildings are used as a training centre. And at the weekend, the auditorium of the school is used for a local church to hold its service. Now, as an emergency service provider, when I get to that site, my, my goal or goals are to protect human life and also to protect property in that order. So it'd be really useful for me to know that when I get to that, that particular location, what its purpose is or what it's currently being used for. Because if it's a school, then I'll probably need to call for backup to escort all of those maybe hundreds of thousands thousand children out. If it's being used at a training centre or as, as an auditorium, then I should be prioritising sending my, my um, resources into tackling the fires in those buildings. So from an interaction perspective, what I'd like to be able to do is pop up my app, 
see information about that, that, that address, but also within the context of its use, see other information, so different attributes. So how do we, how do we go about modelling this in MarkLogic, the data that would that sit in that scenario? So of course, it'll probably be a document. could be semantics, but in this case, we've got a, a document. So in MarkLogic, we'd represent a, a feature as a single document. So you can see here we've got an address up there. We've got a, a bit of geospatial data, a point. But within this feature, we have separate usages. So this feature, we've, we've already said, is used sometimes as a school. And then we've got the multi-polygon, so that's the different buildings within the school, the full set. Um, for a training centre, it's those two buildings. For a church, it's just that single polygon which represents the auditorium. And of course, we could do that in relational model. That's really just a one-to-many relationship between a what the, whatever the address is and these usages. So we could map that over and, and quite simply represent it in that structure. And that's fine. And that might work for a, a particular application. But now, let's find some some challenges, and going back to what was on that previous slide, what do I do when there's variance in my attributes? So what if I, I now have built my application and now I want to record additional information, but the type of information that I record will differ based on the address usage. So for a school, I might want to record a particular bit of information, training centre, different types and different attributes for church. And then a relational schema, I could add some additional columns on there, so represent each of those new attributes. But those columns will likely be sparse, and the more columns I add, the more attributes I model and accommodate, the more sparse my full data set is going to be. In Mark logic, we don't have that problem, because it's XML. So all we do is for each particular use, attach in the fields that we need or that we expect to, expect to appear. What about if I introduce another feature that doesn't fit, in quotes, into the same schema? So here we've got one example of a feature where we've said that it's an address that might have multiple uses or, or does have multiple uses and maybe sub-geometries in there. But what if I introduce an apartment complex, which is a point on a map, so it has an address, but it doesn't have these sub-geometries, it doesn't have multiple address usages. So again, I could, I could add this in to my existing schema in a relational world or a relational database, but now I end up with duplicate data. So I've got a point reference there and a point reference there. And you could also kind of argue um, that it's what you've now got within those tables, in particularly that, that feature table, um, is something that models two semantically similar things, but they aren't semantically identical. In Mark logic, we don't have that problem if we want to model a different type of feature with different attributes with, without sub-geometries. We create a new document and just put in the fields that we, we want or need. So, Modeling features within MarkLogic gives you more flexibility, and that's significant because if you have greater flexibility in defining a feature, in defining your data model and schema, you generally have greater flexibility in being able to build location-based applications. So maybe I build an application which is based on um, just that core data to start with, then I get a new requirement which requires me to integrate new attributes in there. With MarkLogic, it's, it's faster and quicker to build that additional functionality into the application without much, if any, change at the data model level. And similarly, maybe I want to have three applications that run on the same data set. Um, that's, that's easier with MarkLogic. So the second paradigm shift is being able to integrate geospatial data across the organisation. Now, existing, or, or I can't really call them legacy, but e existing geospatial technologies um, or geospatial use cases tend to end up with geospatial data sitting in uh, a different, even different part of the database or even a different database. And there's a really good reason for that, which is because um, when relational databases were created, they were not built from the ground up to cover the kind of use cases which are required by geospatial um, requirements, use cases. So again, in a, in a simple case, you might say, well, okay, it's a pr that's still a pragmatic solution, so let's take a case of some hospital data, maybe from a, a particular medical centre. Um, I've also got some geospatial data in a different table, with this address being geospatially enabled. And then it's just a case, if I want to put that on a map, I can take my data from this table to find out the address, use the foreign key relationship, look up into that geospatially enabled um, table, project that <coughs> out, and render it on some some visualisation, so that's fine. But what if my use case isn't that simple? What if I'm not a single medical centre? What if I'm a 
hospital group, and I've grown over time through mergers and acquisitions. So now I have multiple medical centres and multiple hospitals and facilities. And now the nature of the questions that I want to ask of that data have changed. So I might want to ask, uh, what is the relationship between the different types of patients and the hospitals that they go to? Or more specifically, give me a list of all of the patients that regularly attend hospital facilities that aren't the ones that are most local to them. Now those questions become harder to answer because I'm not dealing with a single table of data and a single set of geospatial data. I've now got multiple organisations with multiple databases, multiple tables, all likely with different schemas, all containing maybe some set of overlapping data which may or may not be needed for the query or the question that I'm trying to ask for that data. Now those questions become harder to answer. So let's take one example of how we might um, <coughs> overcome this problem in adopting the MarkLogic's way of modelling uh, this data. And it's not just the necessarily the geospatial part here, but also data integration in general. So an example of a patient, Sally Smith, who's gone to um, the UCSF and also the Oakland Clinic. How would we take them into MarkLogic? So again, it's a document. So I get a patient document. Um, I pull over from my patient information. So I've got two records on Sally Smith from different clinics convert those to XML and pull them into the document, and similarly with the appointment data. So, single document with two patient records, two appointment records, so that's my view, my 360 degree view of Sally Smith. And now, I geospatially enable that data by pulling in my geospatial location content. Except with MarkLogic, geospatially enabling isn't really as, as complicated as it, it, it sounds, or, or maybe within other databases, because within MarkLogic, just as with We've got a, a date here, so Mark Logic, if it knows something is a date, it allows you to do ordering and, and clever searching and querying and optimizations on the top of that. Within Mark Logic, geospatial data is a first class data type. So if I put a point or a polygon into Mark Logic, it knows what the data <coughs> is, it will index and optimize its queries in, a, in ways that allow you to do fast and efficient searches, and we'll see an example of those in, in a couple of minutes. So if location data lives with the rest of your data, I know this is kind of obvious, but there's no need then to manage it in a separate special way. And Joe Pasqua this morning, I think, spoke um, about silos and overcoming problems with data silos. So in those terms, with MarkLogic, there's no need to maintain separate geospatial silos to do geospatial queries in the same way that in this example, there's no need to maintain separate appointment silos or patient silos in different organizations just to do queries over the top of that data. In MarkLogic, geospatial data is a, a first-class data type in the same way as dates, numbers, and strings. And finally, our, our third paradigm shift, which kind of combines what the, the two that we've previously seen, is the ability to interact with that location data with complex, rich queries. So you probably already know, hopefully already know by <laughs> this far through the week, that MarkLogic has really extensive and rich full-text search capabilities. And the logical next step from the stuff we talked about on the previous slide about geospatial data being a first-class data type in MarkLogic, you'd expect that MarkLogic also provides a bunch of functionality and, and functions and APIs over the top to work with that data, and, and we do. What you may not be aware of, which is this box on the right-hand side, is that MarkLogic also provides a very um, efficient and mature alerting capability. And it's when you start to pull these things together, so full text search and a geospatial search, and some alerting functionality that can maybe send an SMS or an email or, some, or invoke some bit of code that you see the full power of, of these things, of this geospatial capability. Just give you a couple of examples. Again, we've got a, a patient record, so you see how easy it is to do this stuff. So a name of a patient, an address, a bit of geospatial information, and then one example. We've got the full history of, in the document, but just one example of an appointment record here. So what do you mean by a rich um, combined query over the top of this? So a combined full-text search with geospatial, here's an example. So if I'm your records of patients who live in the following radius of Flint, Michigan that mention a particular phrase in the same appointment. And in breaking this down in MarkLogic, this would turn into three queries. So we've got a geospatial query, which can make use of maybe a, a radius or a, a circle around a particular point, that, uh, that coordinate of the address. We've got a full-text query, so it's a word query, effectively, that looks for the occurrence of particular terms. And then we've got this third thing, which is kind of implicit and maybe not, not obvious, but that this matches in the same appointment. So it's a container query. It's a way of constraining matches to the same, same section of a document. So a really interesting 
um, useful question broken down into three queries that are available out of the box in MotLogic. Take that one step further with um, alerting. So we can build alerting functionality based on the location. So similar again, whenever a patient under 10, of course this is a, a date range query, so we've got the date of birth, so we can, we've got functions that can allow range queries on, on that data. Geospatial query, whether someone's within five miles of that particular location again. And here's the significant bit. So here we trigger an alert for a nurse to conduct a lead poisoning test. So we've got operational data, which is both geospatial text, which doctors might be putting into the system in near real time, linking into, via triggers, operational business processes, which can then be invoked in real time. So it's a really powerful integrated solution which combines all of those data and queries. <coughs> yeah. So writing rich complex queries that involve location allows you to ask the where questions you couldn't ask before. So kind of grounding that again, going back to that previous slide we saw with all the tables on there, think how, how easy it would be, if at all, to just articulate those kind of questions across all of those organisational databases, tables, schemas and, and data types, including the geospatial component. And even if you could do that, think about how efficient that could possibly ever be compared to integrating all the data in one place and having um, geospatial and text-based indexes being intersected and, and used in the same database. And it's for those, those three reasons that you've probably seen this slide before, um, but that our geospatial support sits inside our, our powerful set of characteristics from ArtLogic. And Dave later is going to be going through detail in a and the technical deep dive about a lot of these, these particular features within our geospatial support. But just to mention a few, um, so we, we have native, um, ArtLogic natively understands the variants, common variants of geospatial data represented in XML, so KML, GML, GeoRSS, and, and Metacarta as well. Um, we've seen some examples of, not at a very low level, but geospatial search, and we also have a wide variety of other geospatial API functions, which again, Dave will be going over. Um, and all of that either using WS84 or the raw coordinate system. I think Joe this morning also spoke about uh, MarkLogic 9 features. Of course, there's some new stuff coming in MarkLogic 9, specifically geospatial region searches and double precision indexes. So at this point, I'll hand over to Michelle to go through the uh, demo. All right, wonderful. Uh, can you switch to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. There we go. No. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Shouldn't be surprised that worked. Okay. Keep changes. Just to refer back. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So you'll stick uh, stick around or put this. No. So thank you, uh, thanks Garrett for showing uh, well the the functionality of having your data and your geospatial information, context information all together. Um, who of you is working in a space where you're working with data that is in silos? It would be very usable if it was joined together. Yeah, that's that that's quite quite some people. Yeah. And in, in how many cases would it, would it be uh, relevant for you to have a common operational picture of all the data in all those silos together? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's good, that's good. So this is an application that does just that. So this is an application that we built for the Dutch police. <coughs> and uh, we've been using it in an uh, uh, actual uh, crisis situation. Um, what this application does is integrate those silos that the police have to work with. So imagine that uh, the Dutch police, they have about 30, 30 to 40 uh, different data sources when it comes to solving issues around crisis situations. 
So a crisis situation can be anything. It can be a factory blowing up. Uh, it can be uh, some, uh, some big uh, car accident uh, on the road. And when it involves a lot of people, uh, like for instance a bombing threat, then it is important for the police to have a common operational picture of the crisis situation, which obviously is very difficult if you have 35 sources of data to manage. So what this application does is it taps into all these sources and it allows the police to be able to view all those sources in one common operational viewpoint. The way it <coughs> happens now is if there is a real big crisis situation, they drive a big truck up to that. You might have may, may have seen them, these big white trucks. And they, they drive it up to the crisis situation. And it's filled with screens, as much screens as they have sources. And they're all shouting, shouting at each other, yeah, this is happening here, this is happening there. And then the officer of duty, he has to try and understand what's actually happening and what kind of information is actually important. So this application uh, isn't really going very deep into geospatial functionality. There is a geo, big geo component in here, but we thought it would be very uh, uh, good to show this application because it actually combines all the things that Garrett has been talking about. It combines the fact that we can have an operational viewpoint on all your data, um, no matter what kind of silos it comes from. It allows you to have a view on your geospatial data, and it also implements alerting. So in this case, uh, there's no need for 35 people sitting behind the screen. The application does that for you. And because we can teach the application to understand what kind of messages that are coming in are important, because the application understands that, it will alert the officer on duty automatically about that. So that's what we're going to do here. Well, you can imagine we don't have direct access to the police systems here, right? That would be a bit strange. Um, so we're going to simulate a crisis situation. In this case, it's an actual uh, event that happened. Um, and we, we, we worked on it with, uh, with the police. It's, we made it a bit more dramatic. Um, <laughs> so, Maybe you think it's, uh, it's going overboard, but <laughs> well. Um, but it's, it's an actual event and uh, we help police with this. And uh, it, in this case, it's about uh, the town hall of Amsterdam blowing up. Well, obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll walk you through it, uh, how it works and how geospatial information combined with other data points uh, come in uh, handy. So I'm pretending to be the officer on duty and uh, the first thing I do is I create a new event and in this case it's the event uh, explosion in town hall of Amsterdam. Let's create that event. There we go. So what, what, you, what you see here is, is a worksheet, a geospatial map, and a timeline. And it was constructed exactly like this because the police, they all in a crisis situation, the first hour uh, of the crisis situation is the golden hour. And in the golden hour, they're trying to uh, find answers to the seven golden W's. So who knows what the W's are? What kind of words are the W's? Where, when, where, when who, how, yeah, where, wh why, with what? You know, all those kind of questions, indeed. And this, this viewpoint gives them uh, information about all these, all these aspects. So what we did is we created uh, the event, explosion in uh, the town hall of Amsterdam. What this actually does on the back end of MarkLogic is it creates a business rule. 
a business rule that fuels the alerting framework that Garrett just talks, uh, talked about. And what's happening now on the back end is that for every message from these 35 sources that's coming in, we're checking the importance of that message, of that data, in regards to the event that we just created, the explosion in the town hall of Amsterdam. Well, as I said, I'm going to simulate uh, data coming in because we're not connected to a real system, of course. So what's happening now is that um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that is, uh, that is uh, ingested uh, is, um, is uh, Twitter information. And the Twitter information that just came in actually matches one of the rules that we have set automatically. And you can see that we have a match because of the red bell icon or the white bell icon turning red and there's there's a message so this means that at this point in time a real-time message came in well, you saw me doing it uh, about the crisis situation so let's see what kind of information it is well it's uh, it's a twitter message and it's about a big explosion in the city hall of amsterdam and as you can see it was indeed sent from uh, the location in uh, in amsterdam so what we'll do now is we will add this um, event to uh, the worksheet. I see that I'm afraid that I have to switch to my uh, to my uh, own laptop. If it wasn't the town hall of Amsterdam, well you, you all know where it is, it's some, some location that I'm not familiar with. How would that have happened? Ah, it works. I'm sorry. So, I mean, you obviously know where the town hall of Amsterdam is, so it's going to do, yeah, it is a town hall. If it was some location I'm not familiar with, an industrialist strain somewhere in Rotterdam, how would that have happened? Yeah, so the, 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 that all comes down on the complexity of the business rules that you actually create on the back end. So in this, in this <coughs> case, the business rules were uh, primarily made on uh, textual information. But they can be extended, uh, of course, uh, by containing um, a geofence uh, to only search for information that is relevant to that location. Yeah, I mean, where I'm going is that location comes in, you've got to verify where it is first. Yeah. You've got easy one. Yeah. They're going to be more difficult. Yeah, of course. Well, the, of course, there there are a lot of questions and things that have to be managed. Let, let's let's okay. let's first go on with the uh, with the uh, demo and then we can take this uh, maybe offline. So what we see now is <coughs> that the Twitter message uh, came in on the worksheet uh, together with uh, the uh, the explosion. What this does is it actually creates a new business rule on the back end of Mark Logic. Because what we, what we decided with, based on the discussions of the police, is that if there is somebody twittering about a crisis situation, they will most probably twitter again about that crisis situation as the crisis situation evolves, right? So what happens is that because we, gen we created this event on the workspace, so the officer on duty thinks it's important, we are actually following this Twitter user uh, for about 10 minutes to see if there are uh, additional Twitter messages coming in that are relevant. So that's, uh, that's an example. Um, what, what I'll do now is, um, because, because we, have, uh, we, have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of information in, uh, in the system um, uh, that's also uh, historical uh, in nature. So one of the 35 sources is, for instance, the, the 112 data, the, the 911 data, what you would call in, in the US. I don't know what it's in, uh, in uh, England, by the way. No, 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 no. Wonderful. So that kind of, we have that, all this historical information, we have that in our system also. Along with uh, um, messages of, of the police, of the internal messaging system. So I'm searching for what do we know about town hall. I could also search about what do we know about town hall in Amsterdam or whatever. So there actually is a historical message of this event, this crisis situation in, in Amsterdam. 
And it's a message to the police station in this case. A caller that let us know that the town hall of Amsterdam would blow up. The guy was quite explosive. Uh -huh. um, he wanted to talk about how he feels about government. And the guy on the phone didn't give him the space. Call ended and uh, the qualification was that it's most probably fake. Well, this is important information, of course, that we need to investigate further. Also in interesting to know is that it was sent this morning, the call was done this morning at 9.30. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this event uh, to the workspace, which allows me to uh, investigate the information that is actually underneath it. Because this message describes an incident. And the incident was called in by a person. Well, that's interesting. Let's find out what we know about that person. Well, that's a pity. We don't know the name. We don't know the address. But of course, we know the phone number of this, of this person that called in that he would blow up um, the town hall. Which sounds like a lead, right? So let's investigate that lead. Let's search for the um, let's search let's search for the uh, for the phone number and see if we have historical information about this phone number in our system. And indeed, we have, because we have another message. In this case, a complaint uh, by done by a disturbed about a disturbed neighbor. Well, that's interesting. So the complaint is that he is running around in military clothing all the time. He seems drunk all the time, and he's very aggressive towards his girlfriend. His phone number is this. Well, that's why we could link it together. And his address is uh, actually Vijverstraat 13. Well, let's find that one. And here we have a message about the Vijverstraat 13. It says the girlfriend's very afraid that her boyfriend will go berserk. Well, he just proven that. He's ju just proved that. And he went on duty, a uh, partner was killed in action, he didn't get enough help, he threatened he would blow up the town hall, his name is this. And um, this is in, in interesting information also, the girlfriend will take some time off and will go to a friend in Weesp, which is a city near Amsterdam, for the people that don't know. Um, we also have some uh, license plate information here, that's, uh, that's interesting. So this message, I'm going to add that to the worksheet, which again creates business rules on the back end of Mark Logic. Now, these business rules, they triggered uh, the next fact uh, in this uh, scenario, which actually happened, and that is that we got um, a license plate hit by a camera on the road. And as you can see, we just received this message in real time because the t bell turns red, so let's investigate that uh, message. And indeed, it's, it's a license plate hit um, uh, about the car of, uh, of the suspect. And what we can see here is that the license plate hit was done in the city of Weesp. We also know that the girlfriend would go to Weesp to get some rest at a friend. So at this point in time, the police knew that they shouldn't send their whole police force to Weesp to apprehend the suspect because he ran away and he, he, went, he went away. But he's still probably somewhere in Amsterdam and it has no sense to go to Weesp because this is a license plate hit of his car driven by his girlfriend. So this is just what I wanted to show. You know, it, it contains all the aspects that uh, Garrett has been talking about. <coughs> I would like to uh, give it over to you, Dave. So, while we're switching over, a quick show of hands. How many of you would describe yourselves as technical professionals? Non-technical professionals? Anybody hoping for a quick nap before lunch? All right. Um, all right, so mostly technical and uh, so the last section of the presentation, uh, down here somewhere. 
Last section, we're going to get into a little bit more detail on how this stuff actually works under the hood. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff um, and just sort of hit the highlights uh, from current slide. There we go. OK. So we have an example here. This is uh, GeoJSON looking at how a feature might be represented in Mark Logic. Uh, we have, as noted earlier, there might be a lot of other information in here besides the geospatial information. But we can throw the latitude and longitude in there, represent that pretty simple. This one's using JSON. Earlier examples used XML. We're happy to work with either. Uh, latitude and longitude, of course, are just a way of identifying a single point on the Earth. Generally, we can think of it as you know an XY coordinate kind of thing. <coughs> um, again, moving quickly. When we flatten the Earth, we do get some distortion that throws things off a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But let's bring a document into Mark Logic. Um, and when we bring this in, MarkLogic is going to see the structure of the data. This is something we do for our universal index. Any content, any terms, any structure, uh, the hierarchical structure of a document, that'll all be indexed. But MarkLogic does not know that this is geospatial information. It doesn't have a way of making that uh, assumption. So in order to, to do that, in order to, we're going to tell it that uh, in order to enable our geospatial search. So by doing that, uh, that lets us answer uh, geospatial questions. For instance, uh, looking for information about park benches in a certain area or figuring out where my customers live. And to understand how search works, we need to first think a little bit about how indexes work. Uh, you may have heard some talk about you know, how geospatial, sorry, how MarkLogic search works in general over the last couple of days. Um, broadly speaking, we drive all of our searches off of indexes, of course. So thinking about indexes in general, this is the kind of index we might see in the back of a book. And there are a couple of key points to this. One is that we've identified an interesting subset of our data. What is it that we really care about that we want to be able to find easily? In this case, it's the, the set of terms that we're listing in the index. We also need a way to point back to the original source of the data. In the case of a book index, we're going to have page references. And we're going to optimize that list to identify where our, um, to make it easier for us to find a particular piece of information we want. Again, in a book index, typically alphabetical, then we can look down the list, find something, and then go jump to the page numbers. So our indexes in Mark Logic work pretty much the same way. Uh, we can set up range indexes. <coughs> Excuse me. And suppose we have some data that looks like this, and we want to query based on the age element. Well, we might set up a range index here using age, um, where we're now able to do a query, for instance, be, uh, find me documents that, are be, uh, that have ages from 18 to 24, let's say. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the same kind of information we had on the previous slide. We have a subset of information. We've identified that that age is what we really care about. We want, to, we want to make that available. We have a reference back to the original data. Right? We have here URIs. Uh, so for each value in my index, I'm pointing back to the document URIs where this value can be found. And third, I've got an ordering of these. So here I've got simple numbers, but you can picture the same thing if it's strings or dates or something like that. We've got a natural ordering of this information. For geospatial indexes, the same principle applies. Uh, one interesting difference is with the ordering. It's a two-dimensional index. So we order first by latitude and then by longitude. And we can picture this largely as a sort of, let, let's impose a, a card catalog uh, and, and put our map over top of that. Uh, so now if we want to do a query, let's say looking in the United States, we can first uh, do, a, do a selection by latitude, then by longitude. And by having done so, we've identified a set of our card catalog drawers that, you know, that are going to have the interesting points. So we've narrowed it down. That's good. But of course, most of our interesting data sets, or most of our interesting regions we want to work with are not simple boxes, right? 
Boxes are pretty simple, but this has a lot more complexity to it as a polygon. And then, of course, we can get into city boundaries. And um, this is a congressional district in the United States, which, uh, well, gerrymandering is alive and well. <laughs> so we, we get some interesting shapes that, well, that way. Um, so how do we actually do this in an efficient way? We're going to do index resolution. And we'll actually be, well, so quick notes. Uh, if you've heard about how MarkLogic search works, we typically do things in two stages. There's index resolution and then filtering. With geospatial, we're actually able to do a lot with just index resolution. We're going to start that with working with boxes. <coughs> so here we have an example query. This is using JavaScript. We've identified a polygon of interest, that in this case representing the continental United States. We've identified a place in the document we want to target, the uh, coordinates uh, element. And we're going to run that search. So what does, the geo what does the index resolution need to do? We're going to set up bounding boxes and see how we can restrict the search that way. So here we have our United States again. We've got a set of data points. We draw a bounding box on it. So this is the smallest box that contains the entire polygon that we want to search for. And we can see at a glance that some of these points fall outside of the box. Great. Knock those out. That's easy. This, is, this operation is very quick, so we like that. We can quickly rule out points that don't match, but we do have some, of course, we saw that were outside the polygon but inside the bounding box. We can get a step better by using finer bounding boxes. So instead of one big box, let's add a set of smaller boxes that are a better approximation of the polygon that we want to look at. So this way, now we can get rid of a few more of these uh, points that are outside of our polygon. But you know what? No matter how many times we do that, we're still going to have a couple here. Uh, no, our bounding boxes are never going to precisely represent a, a complex polygon like this. So we do get better results and quickly by using more of these boxes. And this is very efficient. Excuse me, very efficient. Uh, we get rid of a lot of the matches, but not all. So the next step is to check each of the re remaining points against the polygon itself. And so here we go. What we're going to do is just look through each of the candidate points and compare it to the polygon to actually do the check, is this one in the polygon? What we'll do is we'll just go south to north and west to east when there's a tie and work our way through this set, eliminating the false positives as we go. So great, now we've got an accurate match. And notice we've done this entirely through index resolution, which means we did not have to bring anything off, uh, up from disk. This is entirely memory driven, so that's great. The question is, how did we do that last step? It's, it's easy to click the mouse, but uh, <laughs> uh, something more complex is going on. Um, <coughs> So the, the, the thing that makes this challenging, of course, is that we're looking at geometry on the Earth. We've got an example here of a triangle with a pair of 90 degree angles. That obviously doesn't work on flat surfaces. It's not how we get it. Um, so we need to deal with the, the problem of more complex geometry because we're dealing with a round object, a spherical object-ish. So we can project a, uh, we can take that sphere and project it onto a flat map. But note, as we noted, we do get some distortion. We can see here. Greenland isn't really that big, Antarctica is not really that big, and so on. I mean, is there maybe a better projection we could use? Uh, there's lots of choices, but ultimately, uh, any projection we choose is going to have some level of distortion. Uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss proved that there's level of distortion. I'm not going to go into that in the interest of time. But bottom line is we're dealing with non-Euclidean geometry. And so instead of dealing with the shortest distance between two points being a straight line, which we would say on a flat surface, it is, in fact, a, the arc of a great circle, uh, which is why when we look at a flight from San Francisco to London, it looks like we're, you know, well, why are we going up over here? Well, if we look at it this way, it makes a lot more sense. So doing this geometry this way is certainly harder. Um, this is the formula we use for, uh, for a flat surface. If we're going to do it on a sphere, it gets a little more sophisticated. But the thing is, actually, even a, a sphere is not really a proper representation. 
the Earth is actually an ellipsoid. It bulges out a little bit around the equator. So the equations continue to get a little more interesting. And I promise that's all. That's as much detail as we're going in on that today. Um, so bottom line, how do we do that step where I just kind of clicked through and we checked whether things were in the polygon? Um, for each point, what we're going to do is draw a geodesic, well, these lines on a curved surface, from the point we want to check to a point known to be outside our polygon, for instance, the North Pole. And then what we can do is simply count the number of times we cross the polygon, one of the borders of the polygon, and figure out whether we cross it an even or odd number of times. Uh, example, this is a map that probably looks familiar to one or two people in the room. So if I pick a couple of random points, um, my point, and then I draw lines up to the North Pole, my point on the left here crosses our polygon once. This is inside the polygon. This one crosses twice, goes in and back out. That's outside the polygon. A simple example, but that illustrates the, the process. It's just drawing a line to the outside and seeing how many times we cross. Oh, uh, so there's a performance tip here, which is you can imagine that the more complex the polygon, the more of those uh, checks of, you know, am I crossing a line? How many times am I crossing a line? The more complex that calculation gets. So the performance tip is to think about how much precision you need. If you can approximate the polygon that you want to work with with a box, your query is going to be really, really fast. If you do need to use a polygon, by all means, go for it. But do you need millimeter precision? Or is meter precision good enough? Is mile precision good enough? Think about the needs of your application and adjust accordingly. What you're going to get is a, a trade-off between time and precision. So adjust accordingly. Uh, let's see. So what we end up with is an application that looks perhaps something like this, or the one that uh, was demonstrated earlier where we're able to, uh, to do some kind of an interesting geospatial query. Here we've done a simple uh, indicate a point, give it a radius, and now we're doing a circle query. We can also do, we can draw polygons on a map, squares, whatever. Um, and we can combine that with our full text search, our, our facets that we've, we've provided, and we can make that an interesting combined search uh, to, to really drive our data discovery. So if you'd like to learn more about this topic, um, there, was, uh, there were a couple talks that were in San Francisco that I don't think were done here, but MLW Online will have those videos. Uh, there is a hands-on geospatial workshop. Uh, it wasn't offered here, um, but it could also be arranged. Contact Mark Logic University or your sales team if you're interested in that. And there are a number of resources online that I invite you to check out as well. Uh, and I'll leave that up for a minute while we take some questions. How is that? <laughs> okay, so may I answer any questions? Stunned silence recovering from the math. <laughs> Fair enough. All right.